What's up guys, it's LOH with Low Tech, and this is the Sega Genesis USB Hub. Let's make it play games. If you haven't watched our previous video where we actually go over each of the parts that we're going to be using this build, I would recommend that you do so, just because we actually do use all the pieces, and it just make the whole video a little bit easier to follow along if you actually have seen that. The first thing we really had to do was take apart the unit, and there's only really four screws, so it's actually pretty easy to do. Just take out the four screws out of the bottom and pretty much pry it open. It does take a little bit of effort to pry it open, but after you know <laughs> you kind of get over the fact that you aren't going to break anything, it kind of just pops open and you can kind of see what's inside. First thing you will notice though is that there is not a lot of stuff inside. Uh, other than the PCB board, uh, there is just a USB cable and it's kind of looped around this little peg uh, that we will have to deal with in order to fit in the Raspberry Pi. So that's what we're gonna have to deal with first before we can actually put anything into the device. Now I could have just taken the files and gone to town on the little post, but for me it was a little bit faster to actually just take the soldering iron and just heat up the peg and just pretty much erase it off of the board. So inside it doesn't look quite as pretty as it used to, but it was much easier than sitting there for 10 minutes and grinding away at this tiny little plastic peg that's in a very inconvenient spot to use the file. Next, I knew that I would have to at least cut out one hole for the HDMI port, so taking the metal file and lining it up with where the ports were on the back of the Raspberry Pi, I just started chiseling away pretty much or grinding away at the plastic until I had a little rough indentation of where the actual HDMI port was going to go and working on that until I could get pretty much I would use a actual HDMI cable making sure that I can fit the entire metal piece through the opening so that it could reach the Raspberry Pi inside. Now I knew I really needed to power the board obviously in order to get it to run, but I didn't want to make another opening in the back of the plastic for the micro USB. So what I decided to do is actually wire up the existing USB adapter that came with my kit and actually connect it into the GPIO ports on the top of the Raspberry Pi. So first thing I had to do is actually just cut open the wires on the end of the micro USB cable that came inside of the kit. And then from there, I just needed to connect those into these two little uh, I.O. connectors that would then be plugged into the GPIO ports on the top of the board. So connecting the wires with electrical tape and plugging those into the second and sixth port on the Raspberry Pi and the GPIO pins. And from there, we actually can just power the device straight through those pins without using the USB port at all. So now whenever we want to power on the device, we just use the same adapter that came with the micro USB, plug it into the power outlet, and then you can see that the lights will turn on, uh, indicating that the Raspberry Pi does have power. So the next step is actually wiring the USB hub into the Raspberry Pi. You don't actually have to do this. You actually can just plug the hub into one of the micro USB ports or into the USB port of the Raspberry Pi. But since the way that I had the board inside of the casing, um, having the, the cable actually didn't really fit very well and I would have needed to get a special cable to actually get it to fit. So instead of doing that, I decided to just cut the USB cable and solder the cords into the, the back of the Raspberry Pi. So as long as you use one of the available, uh, there's four spots available on the back of the board, um, just make sure you get them in order, make sure that the solder doesn't touch. It actually is not that hard. I've actually never soldered in my life, um, but, and it actually turned out okay. Uh, it might not look pretty, but it's gonna go inside. So all I did was from there, cover this up with electrical tape and the board is ready to go inside the casing. So what I did was actually take this black cylinder and keep that inside of the case. That way it would be the, the nut or whatever to actually hold the cable inside the case. So when I closed it, the cable looked seamless, but I couldn't actually pull it out of the device on accident. From here, you should be able to just plug in the HDMI cable, power up the device, and we should be ready to go.
So depending on which version of the operating system or which version of RetroPie you are going to be using, all this stuff will look different or perform differently, although the basic functionality should be the same. This is the Simply Austin build, um, that ones that he shared on his YouTube channel, um, but if there, I mean, there are several, several different ones um, that you can use, so if you don't like anything you see here, know that it can all be changed, um, but most of them will still have the same basic layout and design, um, as well as some of the same uh, benefits and shortcomings. So this is what the Simply Austin build looks like. It has all the different Sega consoles here, tells you how many games are available, at least how many you have on your SD card, um, as well as kind of walking through what is, um, you know, each game is about, how many players, etc., etc., etc. It's actually a pretty nice interface. Um, sometimes I wish it had background music, and other times I'm like, well, I'm glad they didn't put background music. So, um, for what it is, it looks pretty good. It very much is rem reminiscent of a Sega Genesis box art, which is great for the Genesis side, but obviously there's Genesis is only one console on here, so it will not necessarily match what is on the other consoles, at least for in terms of their box art. But as you can see, scrolling through these big long lists of, of ROMs takes a while. And also whenever you click into a ROM, you do kind of get this not so professional looking launcher um, just because that's the way of emulator you can actually put an image to have that load up instead of using this uh, and so for for long-term use to make it actually look a little bit better that's probably what i recommend but um as it stands right out of the box from this particular build it does kind of load up that very windows 3.1 maybe even q basic kind of style of of, of loader but once you get into the game, it all kind of fades away a little bit and you're just playing a Sega game. So please disregard my very bad Sonic playing here. Um, I haven't played a Sonic game in forever and I was actually trying to figure out where the buttons were mapped and everything. Um, and that actually kind of goes into uh, one of the first things I wanted to talk about with this particular build, building something to play Sega games, um, especially using this particular loader as well as just Raspberry Pis and RetroPie in general. Taking a look at the settings menu here, they're pretty basic, at least in terms of the ones that are available right here in the UI. Um, you can kind of adjust a few little things, um, but for the most part, all the settings that are available here other than the controller inputs are pretty much useless. But here it's in the controller inputs that are actually, it's a little bit interesting for this particular console. If you take a look at a classic Sega controller, whether it be Genesis or Saturn, you're gonna see a pretty familiar layout. Three buttons or six buttons, maybe some L and R buttons and a start button. However, RetroPry is actually really designed for more of like an SNES controller and not a Sega Genesis controller. Mainly, it actually almost requires a select button, but there isn't one available, so you kind of need to fudge it here with a Sega Genesis controller. Going through the gamepad configuration is pretty self-explanatory until you get to the select button. Since the Sega controllers don't have a select button, you don't really have anything to put there, so you have to put a another button to kind of make up for that, so kind of forfeiting one of the other buttons on the controller. Normally that wouldn't be an issue, like you, something you can actually just skip. You know, mo all of Sega games don't require a select button, so you know, why assign it to anything? And you do have the option to not assign it to anything. However, even though you have the ability to skip assigning a certain button or trigger or analog, whatever, the select button actually is very important in RetroPie, mainly because you actually need to press start and select at the same time in order to actually get out of any of the games. So since we don't have a select button, we need to assign it to another button. However, we can't assign two buttons to the same button. So I can't have, you know, uh, the, the Y button be select and be Y. It has to be something else. Um, so we kind of forfeit a button right from the get-go. The second thing is going through these, you can see it asks for A, B, and X, and Y. But on the Sega controller, at, you know, there's, there's a C button, there's a Z button, and those buttons 
aren't actually you know shown on this configuration so it is a little bit confusing trying to get those buttons to work and i have found that the y button is actually the c button um but so far i haven't actually run into an issue with the, the missing um x y and z buttons but it is kind of weird going through and seeing you know the that y is now c for whatever reason now I should mention that all this stuff can be fixed, especially if you're willing to tinker with it. But going off of this as like a plug and play console, it is kind of a downside and it's not something that the average user might be wanting to fiddle with. If you are wanting to fiddle with it though, just know that pretty much every single aspect can be adjusted as long as you're willing to work with menus that look like this. So menus that are built inside of a, a DOS emulator almost. Um, and it does give you a whole lot of power in what you actually make your games look like and to, you know how you want to interact with the, the Raspberry Pi, but it is something that in most cases you actually will even need a keyboard attached to it. So luckily it has the USB ports on the front, but just make sure you actually have a USB keyboard um, lying around or else you actually might get stuck in a menu that requires you to press you know, one or two and there is no one or two on the gamepad. All that being said, should you actually build a Sega Genesis Mini? The answer is yes. I mean, if you actually are going through all these steps and going to do your own modding of a case and actually make this into your own project, then all of the little things that make RetroPie difficult to say the average user, is going to be no problem and you're going to work through it and you're going to have a great experience and have a lot of fun actually making it. If you don't want to go through and do all that, you do have lots of other options. If you don't really care that this looks like a Sega Genesis, you can always just put it in, into any other standard Raspberry Pi case and it'll work. Everything will work just fine. You just won't have this looking back at you when you are playing your game. If that's more your style, then do that. Yeah, you just get your Sega controller, plug it in, and you play the games the exact same way you would on one of these, but without all the effort and work. Just know that in some cases, you may need to tinker with it to make it your own. Thanks for watching, guys. This is LH with Low Tech, and this has been a quick overview of the Sega Genesis Mini Raspberry Pi console. Subscribe.